Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's Spirit of Justice conversation between Michelle Alexander and Michael Bennett. I'm Serene Jones. I'm the president here at Union. And this is my good friend, the very Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas, who is the Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary. This is, believe it or not, the second year of our Spirit of Justice conversations, um, where we hear leading activists on a variety of topics, from racial inequality to climate justice to mass incarceration and mass deportation. Our previous guests have included Angela Davis, Patrice Cullors, Naomi Klein, this past fall, Jose Antonio Vargas, and tonight, Michael Bennett. And so he joins a great lineup. And I thank you, Serene, and good evening as well to all of you. I am pleased to be here and am, like you, looking forward to tonight's conversation. As Serene said, it's not unusual for us to have activists and organizers here at Union. It's what we do as we develop social justice and faith leaders. But it's not every day that we have an NFL player who embodies those roles. Michael Bennett, a Super Bowl champion and pro bowler, who is now a member of the New England Patriots. He is a true activist athlete. Off on the field, he runs the Bennett Foundation with his wife, Pele, to educate underserved children in communities to lead healthier lives through nutrition programs, inner city gardens, and cooking demonstrations, as well as free health clinics. As the father of daughters, Michael is also committed to STEAM education for girls. After learning of his Singalese ancestry, he traveled to the country and partnered with the I Am Code organization, where he sponsored 100 African girls. Last year, he published his first book, of which I'm sure many of you are familiar, Things That Make White People Uncomfortable. The book is part memoir and part manifesto about the turbulent times we are now in. So this evening is sure to be quite a conversation. Because in his book, Michael speaks courageously and openly about race, white supremacy, and racism in America and how it plays out across society, from police brutality to food insecurity to the powerlessness of athletes within the NFL and the NCAA. Our colleague, Michelle Alexander, uh, will certainly have a lot to discuss including, as we now know, the family of ministers that he comes from. Michelle is a visiting professor here at Union. Uh, she is an acclaimed civil rights lawyer and advocate, author of the best-selling book, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in an Age of Colorblindness. She's also a columnist for The New York Times and a dear friend to many in this room. Now, before we bring them to the stage, we'd like to let you know that following their conversation, you all will have a chance to ask questions. When you arrived, you should have found an index card in your seat. If you have a question for Michael Bennett, please write it on the card along with your name. The cards will be collected, and if your question is selected, your name will be called and we'll bring, invite you to the microphone so that you may ask your question. We'll try our best to get as many questions in as possible. And for those of you who are live streaming from home, we invite you to join the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag Spirit of Justice. So now, let's get to the conversation. Please welcome Michelle Alexander and Michael Bennett. Good evening, everyone. I'm thrilled to see you all here and even more thrilled to be here with Michael. I've been excited uh, to meet him since this event was announced. I 
have to confess that I didn't know who Michael Bennett was until, until he, until he took his courageous stand in the anthem protest. I am not much of a football fan myself. I used to be when I was younger. I would watch football with my dad in high school and in college, but after my dad died about 25 years ago, I kind of gave up on football and stopped following football. And yet when I saw Michael Bennett taking his courageous stand in solidarity with Colin Kaepernick and began investigating uh, who this man was and how is he showing up in this world in this way, um, I became more and more excited about the contributions he was making and the influence he was having. And so when my friend and colleague um, suggested that we invite him here, uh, Robin, thank you for the suggestion, um, I was overjoyed at the possibility that you might actually be willing to come and so thank you so much for being here and uh, you know my son who is a huge fan and has been following you uh, on and off the field for some time um, told me that if I didn't get a picture with you he was never speaking to me again so uh, <laughs> thank you so much for being here um, there are many things that I love about this book, things that make white people uncomfortable. Um, but one of the things that I appreciate the most is that you speak in your own voice, real talk about pressing racial and social justice issues of our time and how they've impacted you personally, but also how you've seen them impact people in communities from coast to coast in the United States and around the world, but you speak not as an expert, not as a scholar, but as someone who has cared deeply enough to educate yourself and to become engaged in courageous forms of activism. And uh, I highly encourage all of you to read it. Um, it's the first book on racial and social justice my son has been eager to read. Uh, the book has a lot of cursing in it, which only increased his enthusiasm um, for the material. <laughs> But the book is not offensive uh, in any way, and anyone who finds themselves offended by the book really needs to check themselves. This is uh, an example of someone bringing their whole self um, to the page and speaking their whole truth. So I want to get to the book and ask you why you decided to write it. What motivated you to write it. I was particularly struck by a passage in the book where you said, your greatest fear of all your fears is not being heard. And it seems that this book was an attempt to be heard. So why did you write the book? Um, oh, it was working. The mic was working at first. Good, good job, Mike guy. Uh, <laughs> now nah, for me, writing the book was, I felt like it was the, it was my chance to like, you know how you, you speak but the words in the books can never go away. You know, the context of the book, and I wanted to be, oh, okay. All right, she wants me to be louder. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to be able to, you know, have something and be able to have my kids look at it and share it, but also, you know, give something to young athletes. I felt like there had been a drought where athletes had been really vulnerable about issues that were happening around them and showing young athletes what they can do with their platform and not be scared to you know, speak about things that were happening to the, in their communities and things that happen around the world. So that's the real reason I wrote the book was for the young kids. The young kids, I felt like, you know, after you know, you know, the 60s, after Jim Brown and, uh, and then Craig Hodges later on, there had been a drought for athletes to really have that platform to speak on things. You know, Michael Jordan, you know, he lacked, he sold a lot of shoes, but he wasn't the one who brought the communities together. If you looked in Chicago, there was a lot of people killing over them, killing over Michael, killing over Jordan shoes. And then there was Kobe Bryant. 
and then there was like there was nothing there was this this silence and we a lot of us young athletes didn't have anybody to look up to as far when it came to sharing you know our story or finding ways to have a platform and then you know came lebron james and came chris paul and all these other guys carmelo anthony and then it came kaepernick and then it came me then it was all these other guys and i wanted to be able to have something that some kind of substance that young kids can follow and you know like it's not they're not alone there's other people who have these ideas there's other people who have thoughts and other people who are that they could connect with and that's the real reason i wrote the book was for the young people mm. so the title things that make white people uncomfortable yeah, what do. are the things that you most <laughs> wanted people to hear to understand you know it's funny every time i the, the title when i first said it to um the publisher i was like oh first i want to do a book about things that make white people uncomfortable at dinner and it was like a 12 course meal <laughs> and every course was a, a issue that was happening in society and i wanted to you know do it, it you know it was uh you know reserva reservations or oh, reservations or uh or two reservations so it was about native americans in the, in the reservation so it was about it was just about this idea of being able to you know you know, have a book about making people uncomfortable. Then I was like, no, nah, forget the dinner part. It's going to get too, too, because then some people don't eat dessert. Some people don't have wine. <laughs> so then I started, so I just decided just to do the book, just things that make white people uncomfortable. But really it was about, you know, I felt that society has started to be com become comfortable with things that were happening around us. It was just like every time we see something, we started to become so numb to it because it was just how society was happening. Like we got so used to seeing, you know, police brutality, we got so used to seeing gun violence at school, we got so used to, you know, racism, we got so used to homophobia, we got so used to all these different things and we became so comfortable with things and I was like, how can I break that barrier down and I was thought, to really have some type of grow, you, growth, you have to be uncomfortable and I wanted to make a title that was, you know, catchy, but also made people think, like, what what can we do to become become uncomfortable with society and how can we make a change with our platform and with our voices and I just that I feel like that title was kind of raunchy but at the same time I thought it was like a cool title because I grew up with you know looking up to Dick Gregory and I thought he wrote the book and he wrote a book that said the n-word and it was just like that was just like it was just it was just over the top you know watching Richard Pryor and and um, you know all these other great artists when they came to doing things and they had that type of way of being able to bring humor to reality and I wanted to do that with my book. Mm -hmm. So you talking in the book about your own experience with police violence and many people associate the anthem protests um, with police violence and view the protest as exclusively about police violence or primarily about police violence. And you write that for you, uh, kneeling in solidarity with Colin Kaepernick and the protest anthem was about much more um, than police violence. I wonder if you would begin just by sharing your own story of what happened yeah, in I Vegas and I think for I think bef be even before Vegas or things that happened in Vegas, it, I I came to my coach and I was like, you know, my coach, Coach Carroll, and you know, I, I had took a knee and um, I sat down. I had been doing something. Then he came. We had a conversation, and he was like, Michael, why why are you doing this? Why are you why are you doing this? Why are you why do you want to say something? We you know we here to play football. We're doing these different things. I just want to know why you want to take this stance. And then I I, I told him. I said, Coach, you know. You know, when I'm in this building, I, I feel I feel comfortable. I feel like I'm I'm, I'm I can be myself. I can be the, be Michael Bennett. But when I'm in out there, I'm I'm another black man. Like the things that are happening to other people could happen to me. And when I was telling him that, he he got choked up a little bit because he was like, it was me bringing the reality to that, like we're different. Like as much as you think that we are the same as when it comes to coach, coach to player, but when it comes to race relations outside of this building, we're different. I, things that will happen to me won't happen to you because of this color of your skin. So I had to break down, you know, that with my coach and, and explain to him that I had took this spiritual journey. I had spent a lot of time with a lot of different people around the world. I had been to Guam. I had been to Haiti. I had been to Native American Reservation. I had been to Africa. I had been to a lot of different places with people and spent time with people because I felt like that was the true way to really understand other people's story was not to really speak about it, but was to experience it through their voice, experience it through their, their, their tears, experience through their, with their emotions. And for me, that was 
how I came to the point where I felt overwhelmed and I felt like I had been with all these people and they couldn't be heard. The people on Native American reservation, they can't be heard. You know, the woman who lost her son to police brutality can't be heard. The mother who lost her son to police brutality, they can't be heard. But I could be heard because I, I have a voice, I have a platform. So I felt like I had to do that. And it was beyond just police brutality. It was what was happening in Flint. It was what was happening with the Me Too movement. It was just what was happening with people. And I felt like there was a connection between me and humanity. And I didn't want to lose my humanity because I was an athlete. And I felt because, you know, we are athletes sometimes, people build those barriers between us and society, like your society. Like as you, when you're an athlete, you go through this different world than everybody else. Everything is kind of maneuvered for you to have success, whether it's with school, whether it's with, you know, picking the college. Everything is kind of, there's a template to, to it. it is a temp you, you get this score, you get to go here, you get this touchdown, you get this, you get this sack, you get this incentive. But then there wasn't an incentive to, you know, what would happen to you if you didn't have those things. And I wanted to make sure that, you know, when I had that connection to have that platform that I, I stepped out and I was able to have the courage to, you know, share and give other kids that thing because I felt that you know when not having that platform and not having those older athletes to look up to I feel like now that I'm in that stage I don't want it to be another drought I don't want another kid to look back and be like there was nobody for us to look up to I don't want nobody else to look up and be like I'm scared to speak up because nobody's there for me nobody has that I wanted to be want to be one of the guys a part of a movement of young people who were a part of that change for our society and what we see good fit for the kids that look like us in different communities because our voice is so big it's like when you are an athlete and you go into these communities it's so much different when you were like when they bring a certain society to to the, the practice. They might bring a whole bunch of, you know, some different kids. But when you in the hood or you in these juvenile detention center and the kids see you, it's a whole different type of experience because they don't see a player, they see hope. They see something that resonate with them, their journey, and that none they want me that they want to live vicariously through us. And when we have the opportunity, it's not on us to just to show them like, oh, who we would, oh, here's this woman or this car. It's about showing them how to be a man, how to be somebody in society that can contribute at a high level. Yeah, I think it's, yeah. yes. Yeah, um, I think it's, it's important that you began your spiritual journey and took your stand before you were attacked personally by the police. And um, can you say a few words about that spiritual journey? I, I was moved by what you wrote about your quest to determine whether your faith, whether your Christianity was simply kind of an inheritance of slave owners or whether it was real and true for you and that you began reading other about other faiths, other world religions, and you began a process of uncovering discovery for yourself. You I, I, I think so. I think when I started to do that, I felt like I needed to like dig deep into religion to understand my own foundation, to make sure that what I believe in is what I believe in. It wasn't because it was I was a slave or it was dead. It was was because my grand because everybody in my family is preachers. Everybody I grew up with is a preacher. We got our own churches. We got our own ministry. We got our own congregation. Every and you, everybody, if you go to Louisiana, you know the business is being the preachers. We, everybody has a church in my family. So I grew up in the church, and so for me, it was to make sure that what I was learning as a kid, it could still connect to me when I was an adult. So I wanted to, you know, learn about, you know, what, my wife's family was Mormon. So I started reading about Mormon religion. And in college, I read about, I, I idolized Malcolm X as a kid. So, you know, I grew up reading Malcolm X. That was one of the books that I read as a young kid. And then when I got to college, I was like, let me study what he was studying just to see his journey. And then so for me, religion was another journey to having that understanding of other people. I think I needed to break down the barrier of not understanding somebody to be able to understand them. You know what I mean? Like not to have this perception that when I see somebody, I build this wall up against them. And how do I build that bridge to other people when just because they look different from me, they have a different religion, they have a different gender choice, they have all these different things. How can I be the person that I want to be without having all these perceived about somebody because of their characteristics or what they believe in. So I feel like religion was the first step to that religion. And I feel like religion had been used for a long period of time for war and all these different things. And being 
the part of, you know, I had got tested a whole bunch of times and, you know, having to fall back on my religion, you know, whenever I felt like, you know, when I went through my own situations with, you know, with the police or with, you know, with the court system, I, you know, I went back home. I was like, a grandpa, grandpa, papa, you know, we call everybody in Louisiana. I was like, I need that oil. And my grandpa always put the oil out and then he blessed me like, you know, and so for me, that's a, that's a, that's a true, foundation of me so I felt like I needed to go through those religions and understand them to have a better understanding for people in a long story short. So how would you describe your kind of own personal spiritual journey the relationship of that to your activism and your commitment to social justice? I think for me like is I, I think activism and religion are connected I mean if you look at Jesus Christ and what he did what he was what he was doing it, it th there's a reason why he was politically assassinated because he was changing society because the way that everybody was living that wasn't the way no more he was willing to put himself on the cross he was willing to sacrifice himself for something bigger than just himself and i think you know when you think about that and weigh that on yours you got to think that spirituality has a lot to do with that you got to think that spirituality and you know you know people you know because jesus was the type of person in religion and buddha whoever it was when they religion and muhammad they went to the lowest places on the earth brought the people who couldn't have the voice people who were prostitutes people who didn't have those things and brought them to the light and i think that's important when you talk about activism because you got to be able to go to those dark places and bring light to them and i think that's one of the things that i feel like my spirituality and religion had the connection with well, in your book, um, you weave in a lot of data and some history, and you share data on police violence. Black Americans are two and a half times as likely as white Americans to be shot and killed by police officers. We are twice as likely to be ar unarmed when shot and three times more likely to be abused while in police custody. Juries give black defendants sentences. They're 20% longer than those given to white defendants convicted of the same crimes. We are in prison three times longer for the same drug crimes, even though we use drugs, weed included, less than white folks do. And when we get out of jail, a chance for decent employment, or in some states, even the right to vote, doesn't exist. So you had an experience of this coming home to you firsthand. Yeah. When you were in, in Vegas, can you share a little bit about what it felt like to go from knowing about this in the abstract and reading about it to actually uh, experiencing no, I, it yourself. I also feel like some things are divine. And I think, you know, I, whenever I pray, I always say, you know, God, thank you for the, the trials and tribulations, because I think those trials and tribulations are what makes you a stronger person and gives you the, the voice to be able to say it because you experienced it. And I think for me, going through that, you know, you have this certain amount of trauma because you want to, you sitting there and you thinking like my life could be over or this could be happening or this thing could happen to you and you just sitting there wondering like damn like everybody I ever met with like this is what they felt like or this situation and and it's a it's a tad bit overwhelming when you're in it because when you when you know when you're a, a parent you know you officially give your life up for your kids like so for me in that moment i felt like i'm not ready to and i have to be there for my kids like you know think about my daughters and stuff and and so it was a bit overwhelming because I had spent so many much time with kids in prison. Like I, that's what I was doing every Friday. I would just be going to this prison detention centers, just spending time with kids every day because I felt like it was, you know, I was learning. You know, I mean, you when when I read your book, it kind of encouraged me to make sure that when I when I'm speaking, I have the information to back that because I didn't want to somebody to be like, oh, this is just his opinion. I wanted it to be fact. You know, have my story on it, but also my way of sharing the facts and be able to articulate that in a way where people can't really, you know, fight it because it's the truth, it's the information. And I wanted to make sure that in that book that I wanted to show that police brutality isn't a black issue. It's a humanity issue. It's it's people in general who, you know, go through. I think on TV they show more black people who go through, which we do deal with all that. But I wanted to connect the humanity to what people are missing because I've always felt that whenever you see, whenever there's something that happens in life, people choose sides. And I wanted to be like, it's not about choosing sides. It's about the connection to human life, you know, the loss of a human life. What does that really mean to a family when you're talking to a mother, who lost a son and the son had a daughter and the daughter doesn't have a father. That's a long, that's a lot of trauma to one family. So for me, I wanted to connect that in a book and be able to share that with people and share that like, you know, you have to 
be in those rooms with people to really feel their emotions and feel what it feels like for them and, and not, you know, try to weigh your conversation. But now I have my own story that I went through, I had to face and I, and I faced it. And I, and I, and the worst part about it, I had to face it in, in front of the world because I was dealing, people already had a, you know, people already hated the, that we took a knee. They hated that we were standing against something that they didn't agree with. They hated that we were black men and they felt that we were one of the ones who made it and that we needed to shut up because we are the one. We are the, the, we are the anomaly. We are the rare. We are the people who didn't, who, who made it. And I felt like because people felt like that, they didn't want to hear us talk about those issues. And I felt like, you know, because of that, you know, that came with a lot of criticism on all the on all different fronts so you know yeah. so let's talk a little bit about the fear and uh, the courage that's required um, to stand up to the president of the United States and to <laughs> a lot of other uh, people who are very critical of you there's a theme that runs through the entire book um, about the necessity of breaking silences and digging deep to find that moral courage. And it's difficult to overstate the pressure you faced, um, you know, following your decision to yeah. take a knee. I mean, Donald Trump was cursing your name. Yeah, um, you had fans cursing at yeah. you. You had pressure from family members. Um, you had threats but of violence against you and your family. And you you talk in the book about the need for us to talk more openly and honestly about how fear operates and keeps us from speaking our truth and yeah. acting um, on principle. I was I mean I, I got I was lucky because I've been able to talk to some of the greatest people who have had some of the biggest fears on the biggest stages of the world and they were able to overcome them. So one of the people that I felt like I should talk to was Angela Davis and you know and when I talked to her I'm like man I'm like you've been through all this stuff and how do you keep going how do you keep the strength to always constantly be moving having the momentum when fear has been a part of your whole life you know you've been on the FBI warning list you've been people have been looking for you you've been a terror you've been every single thing like and she just like said you know like you keep living for the people who don't have a voice and for me that was like it was like this next step and then i talked to john john carlos and i'm just like how do you keep doing it and doing it and then they just they kind of say the same thing and for me having those people and and talking to them about the fear of of all these things you see the fear i mean fear is a part of it i think fear keeps us alive when it comes to you know being able to have connections but i also think sometimes fear keeps you from overcoming those hurdles of what could happen to you if you lose your voice. But what are, what are we fearful of? Are we fearful of, of not having the change that we want to see? We're fearful from losing some sponsor money, but I fear mostly of losing my dignity and my integrity. And I think that's the biggest issue of it all. Yes. Yes. I was struck by the fact that you said facing your fears made you feel as though you were coming alive, yeah. finally coming alive. Um, you were describing, you know, the real terror of having threats against your family, against your daughters, and you wrote, in a strange way, it makes me feel more alive. What does that mean to you? I think it, for me, it felt, I was saying that it makes me love the moment more. It makes me, you know, when I kiss my wife, it makes me feel that moment more. When I hug my daughter, it makes me love that moment more because I knew that there's people who don't get those moments again. And I didn't want to be a person who didn't cherish the moments when they came to me. So when I'm with people, I, I'm with them. I'm with them. I show them that I care about them. I show them that I have love for them because if you're in my circle, that's how I feel. And I felt that, you know, that fear of, you know, of not existing, it makes you want to exist more. And I think that was important for me to keep going with family and, and showing my kids that, you know, um, that they shouldn't fear, they shouldn't fear, 
They should be the women that they're supposed to be. They should be the leaders that they want to be. They should be the, the wives that they want to be, the business women that they want to be, the activists, whatever they want to be, don't fear. Because if it, they look at their father, they look at their mother, and they fear all these different things, how, how are they supposed to have the voice that they're supposed to have if they can't even look at their own parents? And they tell, I'm telling them to do be a certain way, but I wasn't, didn't have the courage to be that way. And I think that's the biggest reason why you take the steps in life and the risk that you take because you want to be able to leave that legacy which for your kids. And you inspire a lot of people um, to overcome their own fear. Um, some didn't, you know. And you, you talk about the fact that there were uh, top ten players, some of the biggest stars in the league. Um, people who were on the way to the Hall of Fame who would come to you and say, you know, wow, I can't believe what you're doing. I could never do that. You know, on our team we could never get away with that. And, you know, you write about the fact that people have a way of underestimating their power um, and their influence and that many folks were more interested in protecting their brand I think so. um, than anything else. But can you say more about the necessity I, of organizing and uh, both within the league and outside I, I of I think it? in the league, I think there's, oh, this is big mental um, barrier is on your brain and it physically handcuffs you from having this being the man that you want to be because you're living in a world where, you know, an instant world like Instagram, Twitter, all these different things that want to keep you in the box. And this is the way to do it. Like you got to post like this, you got to be like this or society's not going to accept you for who you are. And for me, I just want to show them like, boom, break those barriers. If, you know, who cares about, you know, if Nike wants to work with you or if this brand wants to work with you, or this brand at the end of the day, all you got is your being. All you got at the end of the day, when you're done playing football, those teams, those organizations aren't going to care about you. Those, those brands aren't going to care about you. They're going to move to the next guy who can jump higher, the next guy who's f faster, the next guy who got the most followers. So to not have your voice and look back in your life and have regret for not being the man that you wanted to be or be able to respect your community the way that you're supposed to, you're really losing. And that's not what a true champion is. A true champion is a person who can stand the test of time, stand, withstand those that criticism of the world because when you out there and you playing we've been in the biggest stadiums we've been in in the crowds and super bowls everything when people didn't believe in us and why now the people who believed in us in our community that wanted us to make it this far and now they're looking back at us for us to give them hope to be fearful i just think that's just coward that's a coward to me personally so i ran to a lot of people that I ran to a lot of people that i had respect for that i lost a little respect for but then it took me a little while to you know, do more reading and do more deeper understanding of people and the thought process and the brain, how people react to certain things. And it, it challenged myself to allow other people to grow at their own rate. Maybe at that moment, they weren't ready for that growth. And as a, as a leader, you got to be able to, to let people grow when they need to grow because their voice in their moment, this might not be their moment. You know, I would love it for them to be their moment and love them to have that voice, but they're not ready for it yet. So sometimes other people got to go through spiritual growth and they got to go through their own stuff, their own study and their own educating themselves to have that voice. Although I would like them to have that moment, the time that I get into their face and, and fist up is a time that they're going to fist up too. I actually want the opposite. I actually want them to have their hearts open so we can share a message and be able to grow together. So that's what I had to learn, too, because at first it was just like, I was just like, damn, like, eh. and like then I had to, like, do my own thing. And so I had to dig deeper into that and even dig deeper into the same empathy and compassion that I have for people who don't have a voice. I should have the same empathy and compassion for people who do have a voice but aren't ready to use it yet. Yeah. You know, I, I, yeah. In, in reading, you know, your book, I, I read what I think was more than a subtext of a critique of capitalism and the commodification, um, not only of NFL players, but the way corporations exploit people in all kinds of contexts in the United States and around the world. And you talk a lot about branding and the role of branding and how uh, players begin to think of themselves uh, as commodities you write we have the right to protest and we like anyone else can try to be heard they tell us to stick to sports when we speak out on issues but they don't seem to have a problem when we're making commercials selling their kids sneakers they can't afford or fast food that will give them colon cancer and you talk about the need for athletes to begin to think of themselves as human beings and not as 
brands, um, even though you refer to your bosses as your owners um, yeah, to reclaim um, your own dignity. I, I think you gotta, it's, it's definitely about reclaiming um, your dignity and reclaiming your own humanity because I think for a while, if you live in a certain, I feel like it's, it's, a, it's a certain type of abuse. It's a certain type of abuse on their own psyche. Like they've been abused in their own psyche that they've been trained to want to be a brand, trained to open themselves up and trained to, this is how you got to do it. And it's like, there has to be a breaking down of this, the psychological thinking that I don't have a voice. I can't have that brand. I don't have this. And it's like a brand will, I feel like brands will do what society allows them to do. So if we if we start to change the way that we you know, shop or change the way that we allow brands to think, if you look at what happened at Starbucks, if you look to Nike trying to do with Colin Kaepernick, that was only because the people started to change that. And if the people are led by people who are in those positions to change brands, then the brands have no reason or no way because at the end of the day, they're capitalism. They're about capital and they want to find out the way the capital gains. So if social justice is now is cool, then they're going to try to make it cool. So it's like we got to be able to break those barriers down and show them like we, we you want to change that, but we going to stay the, the course. We're going to stay the course. And I think sometimes when you've been physically abused, you don't know how to, you don't know how to stay the course because everything about you, you've been broken down. So a lot of these young guys, they've been caught since they was babies. They've been taught to think like this since they was babies. And a lot of them don't have fathers. They don't have mothers. They come from broken homes. They're dealing with the type of trauma that a coach can't understand. They don't understand what it's like when you, a kid's been in a foster care or a 15-year-old, a child is having a child. Like, they can't understand that type of trauma or what it brings on a person. So a lot of times these kids, they've been manipulated to think a certain way. And unless they have the leadership to show them not to think like that, they're going to continuously let people use them, let, continuously let brands persuade them to be a certain way. And then in the end, like I said, they're going to be the ones who look like fools when they look back in time. And they're like, oh, I wish I could have been like John Carlos. Oh, I could have been like Muhammad Ali. Oh, I could have been like Jim Brown. And the opportunities are now. Those opportunities opportunities to have the type of change in society is right now. There's no moment bigger than the moment that we're living in now and right now. And that's only because it's now. It's not because it's the future. It's because it's now. And I think that's important that we continuously show young people how to do that. Yeah, it's a challenge, you know, <laughs> to say the least. I think, you know, one of um, the things I was talking about earlier today, actually, with uh, Derek Purnell, who's a scholar and writer and activist who's you know, speaking about how this phenomenon of branding and people kind of viewing themselves as brand isn't limited to the NFL, even in movement work and activism, you know, you've, there are, you can find activists who are trying to promote themselves as a brand on social media um, for the purposes of getting more funding or um, more support. And there's a way in which capitalism conditions us um, to view ourselves as commodities and to promote ourselves as such. And you mentioned Nike, which I think is yeah. kind of an interesting example, obviously, given the way Nike kind of co-opted the message of the, you know, anthem protests um, with their slogan that yeah. they used for, you know, Collins campaign, believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything. I'm wondering how you feel about that, kind of the role I... <laughs> of corporations um, you know, you know, yeah. You know. But I, I do think when you talk about Brandon, Brandon is such a strong thing. There's a reason why when they brought slaves over here, they branded them because that represents something. When you brand yourself, it's a part of your identity. It's a part of your soul. So you got to be careful when people are trying to brand you a certain way. And I think when you think about what Nike was doing, it was what they were doing was basically, you know, making it cool to be social. So it's like. I feel like businesses don't have souls. I feel like the NFL doesn't operate in the, with a soul. I feel like companies don't operate with souls because at the end of the day, they're about money. So when a, a company takes the opportunity to try to change, I, I, I just feel a certain way because if we're going to look at it from one perspective of America, then we've got to look at it from a uh, intersectional perspective of where the shoe is being made and how are people, the money being distributed to people who are making the shoes, how are, is the, are fair wages practiced? It's like, so it's like it's a deeper rooted issue than just the one thing with Colin Kaepernick. It goes deeper to the whole essence of what it is to be free or what is the essence of other people's existence too, not just one singular thought. You know, you talk a lot about corporate exploitation in the book. You mentioned that your father um, worked at Enron um, during the time of its implosion, its collapse as a result of, you know, insatiable corporate greed, and that, you know, Enron collapsed when you were 
15, I think, mm -hmm. 15 years old, um, and that, you know, the NFL and the NCAA, um, you know, profit, um, you know, especially the NCAA I in terms of profiting off of young people getting yeah. beat up for free. And I think that um, was the hardest chapter to write because it was like, it was like such a reality check for myself as the pen hit the page and the words started to come out of my spirit and they started to speak. I started to look at them and then like, damn, this shit is like, this shit is like gospel. Like, you know, when my friends look at this and they read it, they're like, bro, like you talking about me, like every single athlete that I run to, they like, you talk about me. When you talk about the depression, you talk about losing my identity. You talk about all these different things. I felt like you were talking to me. And so it's like, it's, it's hard to like, take a young kid and put him in that situation and expect him to have the wherewithal to survive there, you know, to take a black kid out of a, a predominantly black neighborhood and put him into a, a white society, although America's white, but just take, they go from, you know, from being in A-Leaf to being in College Station where, you know, I go from being a majority to a minority, 1%, and you expecting them to have this certain uh, outlook on life. It's just hard when you talk about, um, college athletes when they lose their identity they don't get any money it's like all these different things and then you put injury on top of that you know it's sports is a hard thing because it's one of the rare jobs that you know where it's mentally and physically taxing and then you got to face the world every single day with criticism so that does something to somebody so you got to really put everything into it as a young kid when you're in college and you got to put everything into it and on top of that your family's looking back at you like you better make it like that's we need you to make it like that type of thing when you you know when i look at my kids i don't look at them as expect them to be the breadwinner for my family i expect them to be kids so a lot of times these athletes their parents don't look at them like that they look at them as the breadwinner from their families so that's a lot of trauma and i think a lot of times they're in the collegiate sports they don't look into that type of stuff they don't know how to connect with people because a lot of these schools aren't built like that they are not built from those communities and they don't have that grassroots connection to the kids mm -hmm. i'm curious what you think the answer is to this. In your book, you seem to have kind of two strands of thought about it. Um, on the one hand, you argue for kind of black ownership within the NFL, and you argue that, you know, until we own um, our own teams and gain control over, um, you know, our, uh, our own labor and our own uh, you know, property that we won't truly be free. And on the other hand, you talk a lot about the importance of collectivism. And you talk about how you wore, you know, a Bernie Sanders hat around the locker room during um, the run up to the 2016 election. And I'm curious, you know, are you viewing kind of the pathway that you're uh, supporting through your own philanthropy and your own activism as primarily kind of one of trying to reform um, kind of the way capitalism functions, the way the NFL functions? Are you looking for some other alternative democratic socialism or some, <laughs> some hybrid think, of all of them? What, I think, what, I think what are like you a, reaching for? I think it's a hybrid of all of them. I think there is like for NCAA, um, if a college, a kid's gonna play and the college is gonna make a certain amount of money, then I feel like there should be some type of 401k or some type of IRA, something for a kid that when he's done that he can have later on. Maybe it's not when he's 25, but when he's 40, he gets that money. Uh, some type of, some type of, um, you know, I know there's people who play college sports and they end up with injuries, but they also end up with the bill. And like when you 22 and you got an injury that can handicap you for the rest of your life and you don't have a way to you know, deal with that and the schools don't pay for it. So it's got to be some type of collective universal care for the players, too. When they leave college, there is a certain five year period for the NFL. But I know the college level doesn't have that. And I think for professional sports, it just has to be able to. I don't I wish there would be a, um, I wish there could be a. a a black on NFL league, but I don't think that could possibly happen because these teams and it's not just the team, but the team is, is the city and the city is the lights and the lights is the garbage. And it's, it's like, it's, it's so much deeper than just owning an NFL team. It's like when you are part of it, it's a reason why, you know, teams bid on that. It's the reason why cities bid on the Super Bowl, bid on the Pro Bowl because it, it's, it brings so much money. But I do think there's a, a way that players can get a, a, some, some type of ownership. I think, um, if you look at baseball and the things that they're trying to do with their contract, I think there's an opportunity for NFL players to do the same thing. Yeah. So 
one of your big passions is around food justice. Yeah. Um, food apartheid, that's what it's been Yes. Told. Can you say a little <laughs> bit about how you got interested in food justice? I found the story that you tell about uh, showing up to that kind of government convening yeah. where Pepsi and Coca-Cola and yeah. McDonald's were there and how that kind of awakened you to the necessity of You know what, I, when I, when I was, just, was telling somebody the other day, like, when you grow up in like a food apartheid, like you don't really know that's, that's going on. Like you don't know that you live in there until you've been taken out that situation. And I think I didn't really realize it with that. You know, like, oh, was like, oh, there's Popeye's right here. Like there's churches right here. This is the liquor store. Like that was just the places that we ate. We didn't really understand that there wasn't, you know, access to fresh food. That wasn't really the thing the that, grocery store yeah, like the grocery store was farther. Yes. Like, you know, my mom had to go farther. Like there's people, it's just, I didn't really understand. The, that concept at that time. But now I look back, I'm like, oh, I was living in that. I was a part of that. I had become so numb to it because that was my, that was my reality. That was a part of my reality. And so when I got to the NFL and, and I really started to dig deep into food, I got invited to this, um, this meeting and I was, and it was just a lot of people from the government. And we were talking about like, how are we going to change food in Hawaii? Because I had been pulled out of my element. I was in Hawaii and I was learning about the indigenous people in Hawaii. I, it was like, uh, and I started learning about the things that they were dealing with with their diet, the obesity and diabetes and all these different things that were happening to them, the, um, the diseases that would happen to them because of food. And, and, and so I was there and I was just like, Dude, I'm like, why is Coca-Cola here? Like, you're the problem, you know what I mean? <laughs> like McDonald's like, yeah, like you're serving a 50 ounce Sprite. Like, <laughs> like they're gonna buy that. Like, so it was like, it was one of those things that I had ended up meeting with a lot of people and I felt like I had, I had just decided to take a stand right there. And I was like, nah, this, I'm one of those kids that you guys are talking about. I'm one of those kids that, who didn't have the opportunity, who didn't um, learn to get a chance to learn about nutrition. Because w what I've really learned about people is that people are resilient. Like whenever I go to places and, you know, um, it's funny, um, it's, I was talking to a friend, Noah, he's actually right here. We ended up being mean friends over through uh, Senegal. And we were talking the other day about resilience. And he was talking about the farms and what people are doing in Africa. And what when I saw in Africa, what my Stanley's, all these people seeing, like, these kids are walking miles to get to school. These kids are doing whatever they can to survive, but given the opportunity. And I realized that we weren't giving the kids the opportunity or we didn't believe in their resilience to want to change. And for me, that was what I want to do with my voice is to share that with people and, and make sure that, when I was in that meeting, I wanted them to resonate with my culture and what I felt for those kids and how I can do that. And that's really how my story became with food justice and being a part of that. And I really didn't, well, then I start to learn that it's a food apartheid because food justice, food apartheid means it's force, it's un, un, not a choice. Some lady gave me a whole dissertation about that. So she said, next time you're on stage, Michael, say food apartheid. I'm going to be watching you. So yes. I said food apartheid. Yes. Uh, so now we do so much stuff with like, so, you know, and I had to learn about, and, and through that process, it's a learning process because now I was learning about the kids who didn't have food. And like, you know, now I built the program where we had to give kids, the only meal the kids were getting was the meal that we were providing for them, and, you know? And after school in the summertime, I was like, whoa, oh, I didn't realize that when school is over, like these kids, they're not eating. The only meal that they were getting was from school. So we had to build a whole program around that to be able to feed kids in the summertime so they can have food and be able to help them eat. And then. That's where I started getting into the gardens. It's a whole, whole little story. But then that's when I started getting into the gardens and I started going into communities and building gardens and then going into schools and building gardens and then going into juvenile detention centers. But the juvenile detention center to me was the biggest change because it wasn't just about the food for the kids. It was about the first time that they had ownership in something. It was the first time that they felt like they had, that somebody cared about them and they cared about something. You know, those kids, a lot of those kids, they had dealt with traumas that I could never, deal with as a kid, the things that I thought that I dealt with was not even in the same level, not in prison or they going to jail, but this garden, this food, what, what they did when they put their hand in the soil, what it did to them when I went back every week and seeing them until them, eating it with them, it was just cooking with them, it just changed their whole perspective and I realized what food can do for people and culture. Yes. <laughs> Well, people have been waving signs at me telling me that I need to let the audience have a chance, but I, I, I have um, one more thing I really want to talk with you about. I, I was deeply moved by the part of your book where you talk about your family, um, the love that you have for your family, for your daughters who helped to uh, 
awaken you to the need to um, speak out about toxic masculinity and to support women's rights and to take a stand against sexual violence. And also um, your relationship with your birth mother um, and the need that you have felt to forgive her. And I, I wonder if you would share with us a little bit about uh, how your journey to healing in your own family is connected to the work that you're striving to do in the world. One second, let me get myself together real quick. It's, it's just, it's kind of difficult because you know, you know, when you out doing all these different things and you, you're doing in the world and then you taking stands on for certain issues that are happening and you facing criticism and you have, you have all this courage, but then you look back in the mirror and you just like, I haven't even conquered my own fears or my own traumas that are happening to me and like my own things that have happened in my past life. And I felt like the thing with my mother was the biggest issue that I felt like I ever had to deal with because it was one of those things that, you know, as a child, just, let me see here. We don't have to go there. No, it's one of those things that, I mean, I still get teared up because this was such a big thing in my life because, you know, I always felt like, I hate getting emotional, but every time I think about it, it was just a big moment in my life. Like, I feel like it was the biggest moment. All the things I've ever been through, even like, Taking a stance in the national anthem, like police brutality, that was the you biggest. Like I feel like that was the biggest issue I ever had to face because it was it was my own reality, it was my own trauma, it was not everything. Because here is as you read my book, I was just dealing with dealing with having this regret about all these things about not connecting with my mom and not having that true openness to the woman who birthed me, and I felt like I just felt like this love and compassion that I got for people. Why, why don't I have, why can't I have that for my mother? And why can't I forgive her for the things that have happened to the past? Why can't I take those steps to grow? And I felt like for me, that was one of the biggest things ever. And it was like having that, finally having that sit down and talk with my mom and expressing my pain and expressing what I felt. I felt like it was like a, like the biggest burden. I felt to me, that was like the Super Bowl of my whole life because it was like, I finally got a chance to be the man that I wanted to be. So it was good. Would you mind reading the last two paragraphs of your book? Um, you say the need to forgive is a precondition for achieve, achieving justice. You want me to read it for you? He writes, I can forgive anyone for anything they have said or done or that their ancestors said or did, as long as they are willing to work with me to make sure today's version of Jim Crow from mass incarceration to inferior access to education and nutrition to police violence gets beaten back. There is a need to forgive but never forget because if we are not honest about the past, we will never change our present or future. If it makes some people uncomfortable, then that's the price of change. It's not comfortable to confront the part of our history that makes us feel shame. It's not comfortable for me to sit for the anthem while people boo. It's not comfortable to lose sponsors or give away endorsements. It's not comfortable to go to the parts of the world or parts of this country where suffering is a way of life. But guess what? You have to be uncomfortable to grow. When you grow as a child, it's so intense that your body is knocking your own teeth out of your mouth so stronger, better teeth can grow in. When your bones are growing when you're 12, 13 years old, it can be so uncomfortable you can't sleep at night. If we feel uncomfortable, we are doing something right. That discomfort is just a period of transition. It's not comfortable to see people in Flint, Michigan without clean water. 
It's not comfortable to see Philando Castile's murder at the hands of police live streamed on Facebook. It's not comfortable to hear gymnasts tell their stories of being sexually assaulted. It's not comfortable to talk about CTE. It's not comfortable seeing kids too tired to move. But the ultimate question is, what are you going to do? Are you going to lay it on the line? Are you going to be a change maker? Remember what John Carlos said, there's no partial commitment to justice. You are either in or you're out. Trust me, if you're willing to be uncomfortable, you will also feel blessed if you can see it through and make it to the other side. Questions. Robin, you have, yeah? Turned up. Can you hear me now? Oh, okay, there we go. All right, so we're going to go through some of these questions. We'll try to get through as many as we can. We have about 20, 25 minutes. So the first question is Aya Zaki. Thank you so much for being with us today, Michael. Um, and thank you for steering the conversation, Michelle. Um, I have a, a, a longish question. Um, do you feel a moral inconsistency when it comes to being active in the community off the field and answering to the likes of like Robert Kraft and your new quarterback, Tom Brady, who have, been, have both been avid supporters of Donald Trump? and of Zionism, which is racist in nature. If so, how do you reconcile your work off the field with your professional responsibilities in a way that doesn't make you feel like your bosses are your owners? Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't feel any moral. I feel like my moral compass is exactly the same regardless of the, you know, the system that I'm in or the team that I'm on, the people that I work with, my moral compass is going to stay the same because it's my journey, the stories that I believe in. Their journeys is their journeys, but at the same time, I get what you're saying, but it's like I live in America and there's this racial construct of the whole life, but at the same time, I'm, my Buddhist teacher, I mean, my um, yoga teacher always say, like, you, there's darkness, but you got to see light, and I feel like in this situation, I got to see the light in the situation and keep moving forward and let my growth be my growth, and regardless of what they're trying to do, I'm still going to have the connection to the community because uh, the first thing I do when I go to the city, I find the grassroots organizers, and I try to find a way to connect with them, and I think that's important because the real work isn't the one that, that's being highlighted on TV. It's the stuff that you do behind the scenes, and the reason that you do it is not because you want the glorification, but because you want to help them, and I think being on the Patriots or being on the Eagles or being on the Seattle, I've always demanded my respect because of the man that I am and what I believe in. And regardless of what they say, I stay true to it. So over, over time, they got to stay true to what, they got to start falling in line on my beliefs. Is there a gentleman named Burl? Mr. Bennett, uh, thank you for coming, sir, and I really appreciate uh, your talk. Uh, my question is, uh, let me just uh, sort of preface it by saying that uh, as uh, you and Mr. Kaepernick were uh, kneeling and protesting uh, the abuse of uh, uh, African Americans uh, with the police and so forth, uh, I would get into a lot of debates uh, with people around me. And oftentimes they would say that 
uh, uh, those athletes, uh, they really don't give a daggone about you guys. Uh, they're a bunch of rich people who, when their careers are down and out, and they, you know, they would say that about Kaepernick a uh, lot, that his career was over and that he's just trying to do something now to stay in the spotlight and so forth. So my question is to you is that I'm sure you've heard that. And when you hear that uh, African-American athletes are a bunch of spoiled individuals who are just trying to gain the system, take advantage of the system, how do you respond to that, sir? I feel like that's I feel like that's fuel to my fire. Honestly, I feel like their criticism is nothing but a true um, a true answer to why we're doing what we're doing. Because when they start to criticize, we know that there's change that needs to be made. So all that does is add more fuel to us doing more things in the community, more connection with each other. Because at the end of the day. We are not just doing it for those people to change their perspective, but we're also doing it for the kids. And it was never about the people who didn't listen to us. We want to make their change, but also it's about the people for the young kids. So for me, I didn't really care what they were saying because they're always saying something. They say something, we miss a catch. They say something, we miss a tackle. So they're always going to be saying something. It's always going to be somebody criticizing you. But the people who criti do, criticize the most are the people who are the most fearful to stand up on anything they believe in. They're fearful to say what they want to eat. They're fearful to walk down the street. They don't have the courage to change society for their kids because they already see society is the best that it could possibly be. And for us to be in this stage, I actually think that having everything in the world and still making a stance says something even more about a person's dignity and their courage. We have Kiana Hill. Hi, um, I'm a student here at Union. Um, and in our classes, a lot of times we talk about everything that you're talking about all the time, right? But, you know, this is a predominantly white institution. I'm usually one of only a few black people, black women in a classroom. So I'm always stuck with the question of, you know, we all want to leave here and do this work and contribute to whatever we're passionate about within like the social justice realm. But it's a two part question, pretty small, but how do you take measures to protect yourself and your family while you're contributing towards this work? But also how do I, a black woman who doesn't have, you know, a celebrity platform, like how can I protect myself? Because my, my friends who may not look like me, you know, it's a little different with them doing the work versus with me doing the work. I'm treated differently and targeted in a different way. So how do I go about protecting myself while fighting justice? Oh, that's, that's, uh, that's a good question. You got, I don't know, that's, that's a, you got the answer for that? <laughs> no. I don't have an answer for that. I mean, I'm curious what you would say. I mean, I, I think, unfortunately, there often isn't a way to be sure that you're protecting yourself. Um, you can have circles of support in the work, um, which can help to fortify your courage, and you can be open and honest with the people you love and care about, about the risks that you're taking. Um, but often, the nature of the work requires putting yourself at risk and acting with courage even when you cannot protect yourself from the kinds of responses you're likely to receive. I agree with you. <laughs> you're the expert. <laughs> Reverend John Vaughn. My soul has hungered for this all of my life as a lifelong athlete. Um, so I'm really appreciative of this, Brother Michael, for being here. All right, so two-part question. Why do you think that we don't hear more about the ways that faith inspires and shapes activism in sports? And why is there not more organizing, or at least it seems to be organizing, of athletes? Um, around racial activism? I, I, I think there is faith in sports, but I feel like the faith that we have in sports is kind of like, it's almost like a ritual. It's like, it just becomes a habit. Like we pray, but the prayer doesn't really have any substance. Or we say something like, it's not really something that really has substance. We don't really 
pray for a change or we don't come together and talk about what we can do through faith. Because I feel like sometimes religion is used as, as a passive aggressive type thing instead of being aggressive with change and being out there and say what the church is supposed to do. Like when I read the Martin Luther King books and I'm looking at the book, Montgomery bus, Boy Buscott, I'm looking and I'm reading and he's saying that like he didn't go to like, he didn't go to the stores. He didn't go to the movie theaters. He went to the church, and he went to the church, and what church helped him get the word out into the voice out. So I feel like in sports, we don't have that type of connection to God. We just, our prayer is to win the game. Our prayer is not to change the world. And I think, do think there is a lot of people who are doing a lot of things that are collaborating and making changes. Athletes for Impact, there's a lot of different groups that are organizing. But I don't think it's at a massive scale because it's really not this generation who's going to be the people who do the change. It's really going to be the young kids after us because now we're giving them the tools, we're giving them the template to find the groups to create their own organization. And if you look at society right now, it's a lot of young kids who are the ones who are doing things. You look at the Parkland shooting, you look at anything that's happening right now, me too, is young kids who are standing up on what they believe in because they're starting to feel that the place where they feel like it's okay for them to have a voice. And it starts with the older people. The older people are starting to give them that voice and that way to say, this is your world. We had our turn and we fucked it up. Now you have your turn, now change it. <laughs> Greg Smith. Good evening, and hello, Michelle. Hello. Uh, Mr. Bennett, I, uh, my question is twofold, and I, I purposely brought my son tonight because uh, I wanted him to be in your presence as well, uh, very much like Michelle's uh, son wanted to meet you. Uh, my, my question uh, emanates from the, the world in which you traffic in, which is playing in the NFL, and I appreciate the fact that you supported uh, Colin Kaepernick taking the knee and you took the baton and went along with it as well. I wanted to know though, with regard to how it's perceived now, I always thought that the person in our White House took over and changed the narrative. And so we who were in support of why you kneeled and why everyone kneels, uh, got co-opted by him and so the narrative changed. That's part of my question. The other one is based on I find that it's analogous to lynching, where if when we're discussing lynching, we end up asking a bunch of black people about lynching as opposed to the white people who are also doing the lynching and are supporting it. And or if they too disagree with lynching, why aren't they also addressing it? Very much like your teammates. Your sport is predominantly uh, African American. Your, your teammates are with you side by side in all the tackles. Your issue about taking your knee, you don't have the support of your white players as well as if the same thing doesn't apply to them. Actually, you, you, you write about how you did experience the support of some. Yeah, I did. I think there was a lot of white players that I felt like who were courageous and I felt like a, it was one of those things that a lot of the players, the, some of the white players, they grew up in places and they didn't really have black people in their, in their communities, and it was their opportunity for them to listen. Like, you know, there was a lot of teammates when we had our team meeting and we started to confess and started to say things that happened to us, they were overwhelmed. They had tears coming out their eyes. They had compassion, and a lot of them took stands. I think if you look at our team, there was a lot of white guys who were taking stance and said things that they believe in because they, they, they trusted us and they believed in our stories and they started to do their own research. But, I mean, I don't know. I, I think it's important that somebody of the opposite who isn't experiencing the trauma to be able to share the message to help the people who are experiencing the trauma to have a big platform. So I do think white athletes have a big have a big responsibility of using their platform to share the message, just like men have a big responsibility of showing the things that are happening in the feminist movement to make sure that we are standing, standing tall right next to our sisters and our wives and our mothers to make sure they have a voice. And I think that's important for white athletes to do the same. But I think it's, it's happening. There's a lot of guys who are doing the steps and a lot of times those white athletes were also feeling not the criticism from the black players but the criticism for their white family but their other counterparts from the towns that they were so a lot of guys that we dealt with like you know some people like my dad said if I do this he's not going to talk to me again so that comes with a lot of courage and I think 
um, as a society, the people who do take the stands, not just the black players, but the players from the other side who do take the stands, we should applaud them and help them go through their traumas as they take that stance too, because their stance is a different type of stance there, but at the same time, they're making one. And I think that's important that we acknowledge the guys who are doing that. Jenny, Kim. Mr. Bennett and Ms. Alexander, it's truly an honor to be here. Um, so speaking of uncomfortable but necessary um, conversation, after generations of not talking about effects of slavery, Jim Crow, redlining, and so much more, we're finally talking about reparation. Do you support reparation? And if so, uh, what form should it take? And what should it address? Oh, this is, this is a good question, because I was in New Zealand, and one of my friends, they make movies, uh, and we were there, and we were talking about, because they're in New Zealand, and they're talking about reparations in America. Like, we're watching reparations in America, what do you think? And I told them, I said that I don't feel like reparations is money, because the things that were taken from us, money can't replace. Money can't replace culture. Money can't replace the amount of lives that were lost. Money can't replace, you know, dignity. Money can't replace um, broken families and losing husbands and losing mothers and being just tortured and doing all these different things. So I don't think money is the answer for that. I think, I don't know how you acknowledge that, but I think giving money to something like that is almost like when you get, take money from something, it's almost like you're saying we settled. And I feel like we, that debt can't be settled. We lost a lot of people. We lost a lot of great people. So I don't think that money is not the answer. I think money People trying to say, oh, give them 40000 No, that time was gone. That, that time for that, after we finished slavery, we, we, had another, we had another hurdle. We had to go through this. Then after that hurdle, we had another hurdle. Now we're dealing with more hurdles. So the money, I feel like the only way you can really fix the system is to give everybody a fair shot. I'm not saying that you, I'm saying that we all line up at the line. And if, we, if you give us the same opportunity as a white person and we win at the end, let us win. That's what I'm saying. I feel like that's what reparation is, is the fair equality to give us the same books, the same water, the same food, and see how we come out at the end. But do you view, I, I'm curious about this though. You know, I, I, I have trouble with the metaphor of life being a race or a competition. I, I was born in competition. All probably. right. <laughs> But when I say competition, I'm saying like, you know, like I mean what does winning fairness. mean? You know, when I say fairness, you, I mean like that we, why we always have to be the first at something. Like mm -hmm. if we had the same opportunities, we wouldn't have a first. We would have people just continuously being the deans of people being the president, people being all these different things because they have the fair opportunity. That's all I'm saying. I feel like that's what the reparation is. It's to finally saying that we're going to have fair fairness and equality. We don't need affirmative action because the action of us getting a fair education, we, we've proved that we learned and we were ready for the opportunity. But I feel because we haven't had that opportunity, giving us money but not giving us the foundation to survive is just another way of keeping us in the cycle. Yes, having a payout without actually restructuring the system yeah. in a way that you know, ensures that people actually have basic human rights basic and human equal rights. human op opportunity yeah. is a payout to continue living with an unjust yeah. system. Yeah, I feel like yeah. if I took some money because my, what my ancestors, like, I don't know if I could like really look them in the eye in the, in the end and be like, oh, I took 40,000 for what you went through. That would be like, you did what? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like, they'd be looking mm -hmm. at me like, you did, no. Mm -hmm. It was never about that. We survived. We survived mm -hmm. so you can have that voice. We survived so you can be the man that you are. We survived. So that's really the thing that I think is important, that they, su they survived so we can survive to continuously pave a new way, pave a new way for the, our kids to have a different opportunity than they had and the opportunity that we had. Do you think there's a role for um, the government to, as part of an effort to repair harm done um, as a result of the legacy of slavery, to invest heavily in communities that are most disadvantaged and to target those investments in a way that is designed to repair harm of decades of segregation, I, centuries of racial oppression. I, I, I also think, I think the investment should be into schools mm -hmm. because I teach African-Americans at my kids' school, African-American history every year at my kids' school. And the, the 
facial reaction, the respect from other students when they understand somebody else's contribution to society changes everything about them. I think a lot of times people don't even know the contribution of African Americans to the history of America and how we built America and what we did to have this. Like to have white people understand that, that's a whole nother, <laughs> to have other people understand what Hispanic people did or Native Americans did to have their contribution to society is a big thing. And I think the lack of history for other people in schools is sad. When we go to school, we learn about Christopher Columbus we don't learn about the people before him or the, what they did to society. So we always, we start off in the uh, uh, construct of hate. We start mm -hmm. off with it. When we start off with the, with the things that they teach us, we're automatically starting off with uh, not just a hate for the history, but a hate for ourselves. Mm -hmm. We start off with, you know, exactly what happened and this and that, but it's never the truth. And I feel like we need to have education. It's like, why do we have to go to African-American school to learn about African-American history? That should be a part of American history because it is American history. Yes, yes. All right. Um, fortunately, we could talk for a long time just yeah. about reparations. reparations. I was just getting warmed up. Um, but I, I, um, I, I'm told I have to close. But yeah. I just want to say how deeply um, thankful I am for your presence. I know we are all uh, greatly appreciative of you being here. And um, your books are for sale. I highly recommend um, that folks pick up the books. Books are for sale in the lobby, and if you want them signed, you need to buy them there and then come to the yeah. stage for uh, them. Before to I be go, signed. I want to, um, Anthony, can you stand up? No, nah, I want to give a, I want to give a, this, Anthony, like, when you're an athlete and you want to write a book, everybody wants you to write a book about sports. When I came to him, I said, I said, Anthony, I want to write a book about politics, and he said, I believe you. Thank you very, very much. Can we all say a very warm thank you to Michael Bennett for being here tonight? Thank you.